Taking three direct hits from 20mm cannon and being pierced by over 200 bullets is a death sentence for any warplane, but not for the P-47 Thunderbolt. According to testimonies from its pilots, this aircraft survived major damage that would have brought down any other fighter, yet still managed to return safely to base on multiple occasions. It was extremely hard to kill, but also one of the most heavily armed fighters of the entire war, earning the respect of its pilots and even its enemies. In this video, you're going to see why. Between the two world wars, American aircraft doctrine was heavily focused on robust bombers with large payloads and long range, armed with machine guns that were supposed to protect them from enemy fighter interceptors, the so-called flying fortress concept. Naturally, this sole focus on bombers led to a neglect in the development and production of fighter aircraft. The results of this naive approach couldn't have been more disastrous for the Americans, as they suffered a complete loss of control in aerial combat and alarmingly high casualties in the early stages of the war. The story of the P-47 Thunderbolt began in the late 1930s, when Republic Aviation started building a series of prototype aircraft to test new concepts and engines. Early versions were underpowered and unusually large for single-seat fighters. Empty weight was around 10,000 pounds, while maximum takeoff reached nearly 18,000. That would make it the heaviest fighter of the war, heavier than the Spitfire and the P-51 Mustang by as much as 50%. At first, this weight was logically a serious problem. The early XP-47 prototypes were struggling to match the performance of agile Luftwaffe fighters like the BF-109 and FW-190. They climbed better, turned faster, and had far superior power-to-weight ratios. To make matters worse, the early Thunderbolts still had canopies partially embedded into the fuselage, giving pilots limited rear visibility, which is absolutely not something you would want in a dogfight. The Thunderbolt's main problems of being too heavy and underpowered were solved in a radical way when it got the turbo-supercharged Pratt & Whitney double WASP engine. This two-row, 18-cylinder beast made the Thunderbolt even bulkier, but gave it some serious 2,000 horsepower. It was later paired with a massive four-bladed propeller over 12 feet in diameter to fully use the engine's strength. The aircraft looked anything but a normal fighter at the time, but with this engine, it now flew at over 400 miles per hour and could fight at altitudes up to 27,000 feet. Just for reference in size, the Merlin engine used in the Mustang and Spitfire had 27-litre engines. Thunderbolt had 46. By May 1941, the prototype P-47B had eight 50 caliber Browning machine guns, four in each wing, which made it the heaviest standard armament fighter of the war. But machine guns were just the beginning of its armament. After proving it could actually fly and fight, despite the prototype crashing in a horrific accident, over 170 units were immediately ordered. Through some modifications, the Thunderbolt was ready for full combat deployment in 1943. Before getting into combat and then telling you two stories about how the Medal of Honor was earned in Thunderbolts, let's first cover some unique features of this fighter. One of the reasons for its absurd size is the extremely complex supercharger system, which took a lot of space. The plane itself was actually designed after and around this system and engine so it could actually carry it, which made Thunderbolts aerodynamic as, you know, flying brick. However, it was also the reason for the enormous power it had to negate its heft, and more importantly, to still have maximum power at high altitudes, where non-supercharged fighters struggled. At extreme altitudes, air had less oxygen, and all other fighters lost a significant portion of their engine power. But not the Thunderbolt. It had a massive air intake underneath the engine, big enough for a man to go through, but the air was not immediately pulled into the engine. It went through a very complicated supercharger system all the way to the back of the plane. Through a complex process, the air was cooled, compressed, and then pushed into the engine. However, this was not the only trick the Thunderbolt had. Later variants had a 30-gallon tank between the pilot and the engine, and it was filled with an alcohol-water mixture. Now, you may be wondering why. Well, this was some sort of nitro boost for a car, intended to be used only in emergencies. This mixture could be activated by the pilot, and injected into the engine, giving it a short burst of some additional 300 horsepower when the pilot needed absolutely maximum power. This mixture cooled the engine and improved combustion when the engine was pushed to its limits, like in steep climbing during dogfights or gaining altitude with a heavy load. Now, after getting their lovely nicknames, the jug and flying bathtubs, Thunderbolts were ready to prove themselves in combat. It made its combat debut in March 1943 with the fourth fighter group in Europe. Its first mission was a failure due to poor weather and severe radio problems. But a couple of days later, it had flown its first successful mission and soon scored its first confirmed kill, an FW-190. Thunderbolt units quickly expanded, forming the backbone of the US fighter force in the European theater. 
Over the next year, it was deployed across the Mediterranean and the Pacific as well. Early models were outclassed by German fighters in climb and turn, especially at lower altitudes, and Germans quickly learned how to gain advantage on thunderbolts. They would immediately gain altitude, knowing it could not follow them. However, later with an improved propeller called the paddle prop, a bubble canopy giving better visibility and even more powerful engines reaching 3,000 horsepower, this difference was mitigated. Quite a few Germans would learn the hard way that the jug had improved when they realized their advantage in a dogfight suddenly did not work anymore. The thing where the Thunderbolt truly excelled was diving. It could outdive practically any piston engine fighter and with the right tactics, pilots could use this to their advantage. As we said, with four 50 caliber machine guns in each wing, it was one of the most heavily armed fighters of the entire war. Combined rate of fire was about 100 rounds per second and with around 3,400 rounds of ammunition, it had roughly 30 to 35 seconds of total firing time. The guns were staggered in the wing to smooth the airflow and so they could be loaded from the sides. They were usually zeroed to converge their fire at about 750 feet ahead. And any target, whether in the air or on the ground, in that circle was not having a great day. Pilots would usually adjust convergence depending on their personal tactics. When firing all eight guns at once, the recoil was so strong it would actually slow the aircraft down by about 30 miles per hour. But machine guns were just one part of the armament. The P-47 had three hard points, one under each wing and one on the centerline, that could carry a wide range of external ordnance. In its fighter-bomber role, it typically flew with either one 1,000-pound general-purpose bomb on the fuselage and two 750-pound bombs under the wings, or it could carry up to 10 5-inch high-velocity aircraft rockets. This gave the Thunderbolt enough firepower to take out tanks, trains, bridges, convoys, and pretty much anything else unfortunate enough to be on the receiving end. Now, why was the Thunderbolt so hard to kill? English pilots joked that the best technique to avoid fire was to run around to the far side of the cockpit and hunker down until the firing stopped. This joke was because of its huge cockpit, much larger than any other fighter at the time. However, it was true that the Thunderbolt could eat some serious damage and still fly back to base. Its air-cooled engine was much harder to put out of action compared to water-cooled ones. If the radiators were hit or the coolant lines were cut, a water-cooled engine would quickly overheat, which was not the case with the Thunderbolt. These aircraft were going back to base with literally half of their cylinder heads missing. The whole plane was just massive and bulky, so it was very hard to disintegrate after receiving bursts, even from the Germans' much-feared 20 and 30 mm auto cannons, which was even recorded by German pilots. They noted that Thunderbolts were extremely hard to shoot down, and they had to be very careful around them. At first, the Thunderbolt focused on bomber escort and air superiority missions, but as the war evolved, so did its role. Because it had extremely high fuel consumption, this severely restricted its range and initially made it unsuitable for long-range escort missions. The problem was later solved with external drop tanks, allowing it to reach much deeper into enemy territory. However, for long bomber escort, the lighter and more fuel-efficient P-51 Mustang eventually took over, and the Thunderbolt found its niche as a rugged, heavily armed fighter bomber, excelling in ground attack and close air support. With its heavy payload, it became one of the best fighter bombers of the war. Thunderbolts were soon diving on German troop columns, destroying fuel convoys, hunting trains, and smashing anything that moved behind enemy lines. They were credited with destroying over 9,000 railcars, 86,000 trucks, and more than 6,000 armored vehicles. They also shot down nearly 4,000 enemy aircraft in the air and destroyed over 3,000 more on the ground. With more than half a million combat sorties flown, the P-47 became one of the most feared and most effective multi-role aircraft of the war. However, do not forget, it still could dogfight. And two pilots would earn the Medal of Honor in them, the highest military award of the United States. The first was Colonel Neil Kirby. On October 11, 1943, he led a flight of just four P-47s on a fighter sweep over the big Japanese base at Wewak, New Guinea, when they ran into 40 enemy aircraft. Kirby led the ensuing fight and shot down six enemy planes, somehow surviving the engagement. He would have 22 victories before he was eventually killed in action five months later. The second was First Lieutenant Raymond L. Knight. In the closing days of the war, during a pair of missions over northern Italy, Knight volunteered again and again to lead low-altitude attacks on enemy airfields, strafing aircraft while flying through a storm of anti-aircraft fire. On the second day, his Thunderbolt took heavy damage. But instead of bailing out, he tried to nurse it home, knowing his unit did not have enough aircraft. However, the Thunderbolt sadly went down in the Apennines, killing Knight in the crash. He was just 21. The Thunderbolt ended the war with an aerial kill ratio of 4.6 to 1. 
Around 3,500 were lost during the war, out of 15,000 produced, making it the most produced American fighter of the Second World War. After that, their active combat career ended. If you are interested in more such videos, check out our channel for more.